Okay, go. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to my podcast. I'm Leanna Shavina, and thank you for tuning in to The Fingerprint Files. Okay, so first of all, let's address the elephant in the room. I only posted once last year, but don't worry, because this year I'm planning on doing it more, guys. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay on track. Guys, don't even worry about that, but keep me accountable. Um, we also have a very special guest on this episode. Hello, it's Anya. This is Anya, okay. Um, and today, the case that we're going to be talking about, trigger warning, because it can be pretty brutal. And then there's also mentions of kidnapping and murders, of course, like every other episode. Um, but this is about a series of cases that are called the lipstick murders. <laughs> All right, so imagine this. It is June 4th, 1945. 43-year-old Josephine Ross and 33-year-old Frances Brown laid in their homes, dead. Both had suffered fatal stab wounds and Frances was shot. But both murders showed the same brutality. Police believed them to be linked to the same killer. I mean, I don't know about you, but personally, I don't think being stabbed and shot is on my bucket list. What do you think about that part so far? Um. I don't understand how that shows exactly the same person. I don't know. I mean, maybe there's, maybe there's just not enough detail to it. I guess so. Maybe it's also since it's like around the same time frame, since they're both killed murder. I mean, brutally. But like, I yeah. mean, that has it, there's no where, proof. Where were they killed? Chicago. Okay. So, 43-year-old Josephine Ross and 33-year-old Frances Brown both laid in their homes dead. They were both in Chicago and both killed with the same brutality. So the police just thought, oh, well, then it's the same killer. But I mean, that doesn't really prove much. But in Brown's apartment, the famously chilling message was written in the victim's lipstick above her bed. It says, for heaven's sake, catch me before I kill more. I cannot control myself. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> No, we, we can't laugh because I was like, oh, right sorry. <clears throat> sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I mean, for me, what would you say? Like, the first thing you walk into a house and you see such a chilling note after finding out that, like, your loved ones have been murdered. Um, I would change my name, move to a new country, um, and then just learn a new language. Of course. Start in a completely go other... different life. I can. That's terrifying. Yeah, I mean, like, here he's confessing that, like, he can't, he can't control himself. He's gonna do. He's not planning on stopping with these two women. He's planning on continuing on killing many more. Mm-hmm. After finding this note, the media went absolutely crazy, and the public was frightened, and the killer was still at large. About a year later, Suzanne Degnan, she was a six-year-old girl and she was abducted on January 7th, 1946 from her bedroom in Chicago. There left a ransom note there that demanded $20,000 for her safe return. But a few hours later, her body was found dismembered in the sewage drains of Chicago. Um, does she have any relation with the other victims? No relation. Okay. It's just like these are all completely... Okay, all of them are female and uh, they were all in Chicago that's the only relation that they have though but um, the same year a few months later Herons was found robbing an apartment and was reported to the police by another neighbor once Herons figured out that the police were on to him he ran away and the police pulled a gun on him but he was eventually knocked out with a falling flower pot that's so embarrassing <laughs> oh my Stop. gosh <laughs> Imagine running away. I think and robbery he's is a like, little bit more embarrassing. Yeah, but like... And murder. But like robbery and then also running away. Like imagine getting caught. That's so embarrassing. Caught by a flower pot. <laughs> it's getting Mario Kart. Like no, Mario actually, when this stuff falls in your head. Like this and I'm is, just imagine him like flattening. Like his life is a movie, but not in, not in a good way. Like honestly, that's so embarrassing. Imagine. I'm sorry. Imagine. Okay, don't, don't rob a house or anything, but imagine you're robbing a house. You're running away from the cops. <laughs> Bam. Smacked in the head. Knocked clean out by a flower pot but anyway he was arrested and he was taken into the county jail where they took his fingerprint and registered him as one of the main suspects in the lipstick killer case which like wait quick question (laughs) why did they take a guy 
who was robbed got taken out with a flower pot and they go oh yeah he he's that's a suspect what I'm saying. A lipstick killer like, that's what? what i'm saying that makes no sense they're taking him from chicago a month later i mean a month later after all of these cases and everything they're taking him like a they're taking some random person who was robbing somebody's house yeah and marking him as the main suspect for the lipstick killer case did is he, it in the same area did he fit the profile like did they have like a height and weight and race of the person no they didn't and have any profile at all they had no idea who did this it could have been a man a woman a that little no crazy child i don't know the only the only connection between him and the lipstick killer is that they both were desperate for cash cash yeah because he did a um ransom Oh, that's right. You're right. But he actually never got the ransom, so maybe he wasn't no, that No, he didn't get the ransom, and he didn't even wait to see if they would have paid the money, because a few hours later, bam, she was found dead. We don't know how many hours she was found dead. So yeah. she could have been dead before the ransom was also made. So, either way, he was arrested and taken to county jail and marked down as one of the main suspects for the lipstick killer case. And through all of this, he was unconscious. Um, they ran his fingerprints and matched them to the fingerprints on the ransom note of Suzanne Degnan. Okay. So, okay, so that's the that, same person. That makes that part... Yeah, that makes sense That now. part starts connecting some of the dots because since they matched to Suzanne Degnan, I guess they can see, oh, they are all brutal murder cases. Maybe he's the one who killed the woman. But, I mean, I still feel like it doesn't Again, really... I don't see the connections really between Suzanne and the other two victims. I guess since it, like, happened around the same time, since it was only, like, a few months later. But, like, come on. His name, after that, was released to media. They really jumped the gun there because they had completely released his name to media saying that he was a lipstick killer. Oh, Ruining. Wow. Even if he wasn't the lipstick killer, that would have ruined his life forever. Yeah. And Herons refused to confess and then was injected with the truth serum, also known as sodium pentothal, and was given a spinal tap without anesthetic to see if he was acting delirious. He was essentially tortured yeah. to give a confession which could have been true but i feel like under that circumstance of what they did it's not like i would have said anything to get out of there exactly and that's not where it stops either because he was then tied down to a bed in a room with a single light bulb while recovering from his head injuries and being questioned repeatedly okay so this is when the miranda law didn't exist so i mean doing anything like this was justified and it could be legal like they wouldn't get the police wouldn't get in any trouble for anybody who doesn't know the miranda law is the law that you have the right to remain silent and that anything you can and say will be, will be used against you in the court of law so after after being questioned everything herons just he kept denying that he was guilty but he ended up losing hope when this newspaper article was released titled the heron story how he killed suzanne dugnan and two women the article claims that Herons had confessed and showed much detail about the confession and about the murders. So here, there's a problem with this. Herons never confessed. He never said anything about the murders. He never confessed. He actually had adamantly said that he was not guilty. But this article was released saying that he confessed. So after losing all hope, Herons actually did confess, thinking that it might be better than the death penalty, of course. So he confessed using the information from that article posted to go into great detail about the murders. Later, after, you know, after getting like sleep and after recovering, he then rescinded the confession saying that he was forced and he felt like he had no other choice rather than to confess. Heron spent the next 65 years in prison and he rescinded the confession multiple times and begged them to believe that he wasn't guilty. Mm -hmm. Theories say that one of the reporters may have been the one to write the message in lipstick. Um, they also specify that a reporter got there before the police and then wrote the message on the wall to have a more media-worthy story. I feel like if there was a reporter to do such a thing, that's so sick, just disgusting, that they it, could like... It goes against so much ethical laws of journalism. Yeah, and then like, if that, if that happened, then that like pinned so much on that poor man honestly yeah and because then, like this note even if the note was true i feel like it doesn't fit with herons because i don't know maybe i understood it a little differently to me it sounded like a guy who was kind of or a girl you know who was very much of like or a, a girl we don't discriminate <laughs> <laughs> woman can be killers too <laughs> um <laughs> okay sounds like a person who is having these manic disorders mm -hmm. and they're struggling to stop themselves from the urge of killing and they're like please help me 
So to me, it sounds like somebody that would immediately confess if they were forced onto it, especially with that stuff that he went through, you know, and Williams not confessing until the very, very end. It didn't sound like a matching to the personality that the writing said. Yeah. To me, I have a different take on it where I feel like, yeah, definitely this person, whoever wrote that note, definitely not mentally sane. But I also don't, I don't feel like if they had the chance to, they would confess because I feel like, I mean, if you really wanted to confess, you could find a way. But from that note, it just sounds like, it sounds like they're really just, it's like a game to them, you know? For those who don't remember the note, let me read it again. For heaven's sake, catch me before I kill more. I cannot control myself. So to me, that just sounds like this man or this woman was was killing as like a game, as like he is taking this as something to be made fun of, something to be laughed at. That's I mean, that's the take that I put on it because I mean, I cannot control myself. It does show that he has the manic uh, manic fits. I mean, he really can't control itself, but like, I mean, there are ways that you can confess if you really, really wanted to. Yeah, and that's interesting to me because the way that that note was perceived really depends on how the police viewed it and what take they took onto it. Um, and I think that can change a lot of the way the de detectives go at the case. Yeah. There's a perception of the killer, which is why profilers are a big thing yeah. for real life cases today. It's great because like our uh, police force and um, whatever, you know, evolved so much up to this time yes. that we can now do things like this. Because this was all the way back in 1945. We yeah. didn't have all the technology we have I now. Listen, I listen to like Unsolved Murders and yeah. podcasts and all of them is just because the fingerprint stuff got messed up and because yeah, they didn't have the technology just, they do today. Thank God that we have stuff like that. Yeah. But this, I mean, this theory, it would make sense since the handwriting didn't match Heron's handwriting. But I mean, until this day, it's still heavily disputed. So what do you yeah. guys think happened?